I'll just um, name them. I'm not going to go through all of these CVs. You, you should then have that with you. And I'll ask them each to then expand on their work. So on my far right, we have Sarah Brookhausen, um, who's done restoration of the archives of the Ravonia trials that you may have experienced that side. Uh, we have Helena Adamo. <laughs> We're working on to this. And who's the co-director of, of Mozart 360. So she's been applying new technology to sound. We have Dr. Tegan Bristow, who's been a doctor for a month. lecturer at WITS. Um, so she blends new technology with culture. And then, Panele Costa, thanks for representing the men in, 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 in arts, um, who works with a digital medium in, in art processes. Sure. Do you want to keep off and, and share your work and then we'll make a way now? Yeah. Um, so I actually started drawing when I was five years old. And it has reached to a point where I now draw on my cell phone. And just to kick off on the idea of imagination, I think by the time I was eight years old, I had envisioned a future where I'd be in Paris. And I did not know how that would happen because I stayed in a community of a thousand people. And likely my heart is taking me there. And what I do currently is illustration and I illustrate for fashion houses. I do solo exhibitions of my personal work and also curate other people's work. <laughs> um, and as before, my name is Tegan Brister, and yes, I'm a doctor as of a month ago, which is very exciting for me, because it took five years. Um, but uh, the it's, I thought this is a good point to talk about what I do and the, 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 my dissertation, which like I said took five years, um, was called Post-African Futures and basically it was an exploration of decolonizing aesthetic practices within the technological space in Africa and specifically looking at Johannesburg and Nairobi as cases. Um, and in that I was able to sort of unpack um, what I call cultures of technology, so really trying to understand what are the histories, um, social, economic, political histories of different centers in Africa, and how does that then translate as a culture of technology? Um, but like Nancy said, I am a lecturer at this university. Um, I also am an artist, and I'm also the director of a festival which runs out of the small home precinct, um, annually called the Bangazi African Digital Innovation Festival. Um, and part of, actually the festival came out of that research, um, a real need to develop a platform and a place of critical engagement around culture and technology. So, yeah, that's me for now. Hello, so I'm um, Ellen, and um, well, I'm here representing France a bit tonight, so forgive my accent. And um, when I started my career initially in uh, 3D medical imaging, so very far away from arts, but uh, as soon as I started, uh, let's try like this. Um, so, yeah, I was missing some purpose for, for that uh, technology, and especially I was really writing songs, playing guitar, and I was missing some creativity there. So I found my, uh, my way by uh, changing career and moving to the new media uh, world, which means uh, only your contents and storytelling uh, through technology. So. Uh, how to bridge art and technology is really something that has been uh, obsessive for me since I'm a little kid. It took me 30 years to get there, but now I know. So um, I started working for Camera Sida about five years ago, and uh, we did the first, I think, 360 uh, video. At that time, it was really a bad resolution, but it was a piece of art uh, mixing an orchestra filmed live, like the Mozart. 360 and uh, animation. So it was only on an iPad, there was no headset, but I knew that there was something different about uh, allowing the audience to have more liberty and more freedom during their watching. And, uh, and I moved on 
to uh, Mozart 360. This is the reason why I'm here. But we also, um, I also produce uh, 3D real-time location-based VR experience. I mean, we are trying to bring this new media content and this new storytelling to location, to museum, so that people get out of the screen to go in another screen, but to go together somewhere, like we go to a movie and have an experience and not just watch a web documentary alone and feel depressed about that after, and feeling we can't do anything about it to change anything in this book. So I'm very happy to be here and to talk about that. Oh, okay, there we go. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Sarah Brunhausen. I am um, a month into starting my PhD, so <laughs> opposite end of the scale, unfortunately. Um, any tips and hints will be welcome. Um, so I worked on the Rabonia Trial Archive project. Um, I was hired by EFAS to do a six-month contract where I essentially created um, I had to map out all of the archives that were pertinent to the trial, which there's about three or four in South Africa, from the National Archives to the museum trial where they have personal collections and the Vince historical papers. Um, and then I got to sit and listen to the recordings for hours and hours on end and create a description and all the metadata to put up for the National Archives and for INA, the French uh, company that actually handled the digitization process. So I feel like a bit of an intruder because I'm actually a historian and not an artist or very often engaged in new technologies. Um, I work mostly with the same archive, which has a bit of a bad reputation for good reasons, but also it's seen as a very technocratic space and a, a very um, formal space that lacks aesthetic or creative value. And I think the importance of the Ravonia trial dictabouts is precisely that that it can dispel that myth somewhat. It's a lot more engaging to listen to the trial than to have to sit and go to record transcripts, even though hats off to the clerk because they're very comprehensive. You, you can't pretty much read the whole trial. But um, one of the kind of the biggest observations I made in listening to the dictabouts in conjunction with the rest of the archive was the extent to which the everyday comes out through the epic debates. I mean, you really miss the spectacular moments that are written about in all biographies. Um, Nelson Mandela raising his fist and saying Mandela, uh, people outside singing Nkosi uh, Sibelele, so on and so forth. You don't get any of that. It's like, as the judge comes in, click, one of the clerks puts it on, as soon as he adjourns, it's put off. So a lot of that drama that has become the key reference point for when people talk about the Ravonia trial are absent. And that's actually a great thing because we mention the trial often, but we very rarely discuss it and actually know what happened. I mean, we can maybe name three or four of the 173 witnesses that were brought during the entire trial process. So um, I think that it, it's really broadening scope for having different people aside from historians or just old old people going to the archives to look up their family histories, like old white people, that's essentially all the people that are engaging with it, to be honest. But there's so much scope for a lot more, like, I mean, that extract of Nelson Mandela's diary from when he was touring through Africa uh, prior to his arrest, that was all handed in as part of the exhibits. Photographs, personal extracts, I mean, uh, there's so much wealth for creative engagement, and having this new technology and um, storing the dictabouts has been um, kind of a gate that can open to so much more. So yeah, okay. <laughs> but like, does new technology mean creativity? I mean, some people may argue, just to play devil's advocate, that this is not authentic art. Why are we calling it art? Like, why are we calling it creative? Yeah. Um, it's been around for ages. Some of the fun that you bring. For me, um, I think what is absolutely fantastic in this new area is that we need each other to create, to create. It was always the case, but today we are missing more than ever any kind of talents. We definitely need 3D artists uh, that were not considered artists that's so, not so long ago. We need IT, uh, very, very specific IT engineers to be able to collaborate with artistic director that they don't speak the same language, they don't use 
the same instinct in the brain. And suddenly I am doing the bridge between those people so that they collaborate and they they have to be creative and find new solutions to collaborate and to understand that um, they have to share idea, ideas to make a, a great project. Otherwise, it will, it will not be uh, efficient at all and all this virtual reality, because mainly this is what is what we are putting our hope for tomorrow, uh, will not emerge and it will remain like web documentaries, very, um, very, very much watched only by very educated people in the Western world. Uh, and so it is a big limitation. So today people are gathering and create uh, new things that we have never done before, like uh, mixing uh, filming with animation or mixing filming in documentary, like filming combatants, for example, in one of our projects, being able to reproduce them 3D and allowing the audience to literally meet them. Like, they go to a museum, they put a backpack and a headset, and they walk and meet the 3D uh, combatants that are really photorealistic, so they don't end up saying, wow, what an experience. They go out and say, I met those guys. And that's something we could not uh, achieve before that. Either you were a rock on that, risking your life, and you met them. them, or you don't, because it's not the same being sitting in front of the TV and then being into a headset, captive with your attention, focused on one subject only. I can hold, follow, I can have so many follow-up questions, but I'll, I'll keep some room for the audience. Um, Tegan, I'm very keen for you to wear your, both your hats as an artist as well as a, as a, as a lecturer. Um, what trends are you seeing in terms of technology's ability to influence culture? And what does it mean for your personal work? I think, yeah, this is an interesting thing because it, um, I've been in the field for, for quite a long time and um, it was very, very recently that we've seen sort of a massive um, impact of technology and culture coming together, and I think really that what that's where that's come from is that technology is so pervasive. Like everybody's got a piece of technology either in their hand or in their pockets right now, and um, the the understanding that if you don't engage culture or essentially creativity, the culture needs creativity, we we will be left behind, and technology might consume us in a way. Um, and I think from an African perspective, it's very much in a way that it could be almost neo-colonial. It has an opportunity to really kind of mess with what we understand culture to be, um, with how we engage with, with creativity and what that means on a very um, kind of philosophical, but also um, so both social, economic, but also kind of community-oriented understanding of what culture means. And um, the difficulty of what um, the ambassador was saying before about how you know, the content is the, <laughs> is the meat, but really there's a burger coming in, into your mind. Um, and how do we then begin unpacking that? So from those are sort of the big philosophical questions. So it's very important for us to be taking technology in our hands and really interrogating it, um, either making it ourselves or uh, working with it. And I, I think the, the huge influx of um, interest, I mean, you said the road trend. Um, so it's kind of hard to to identify, because there's so many trends in technology, every year something new happens. Um, but the sort of general influx of, of engagement um, in that space um, is because people are suddenly needing to, to, to look at it and do it. Um, is, that, is that answering the question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, Vanilla, you started your career when you were five years old. <laughs> do we all need to start at five? Please share some of your, your story of, of how your work has evolved and like what what revenue models you know are you are you are you using you know what's your livelihood and I think quite often there's this perception that art always needs to be sponsored is that true can we have decent livelihoods from it so I'd like to share some of your personal story my personal story is regarding my art making uh, I actually started on creating on a diary, and I'm specific about calling it a diary instead of a journal because 
seeing a diary, I wanted to create emotion, like capture emotion and what I went through in each day of my life. And what was interesting about that is that um, when I was growing up in Swaziland, the society kept on saying, um, why are you keeping a diary? Um, and boy, boys are not allowed to do that. And for me, it was a private thing. So I would create in private, even my mom didn't know that I had a diary. So I've kept a diary since I was eight. And what has been interesting is that um, with technology coming through, and at one point, uh, I think I owned my first, my first cell phone when I was 13 years old. And this is like a while ago, I think it was in 2004. And it was like a 1.3 megapixel. And it was exciting to see what I could do with it. And I think I've just had a huge interest in technology. And by the time I got to varsity, all my siblings would get a laptop, a cell phone. I didn't get that. And for me, how I got that, I actually got my first contract when I was in second year, and it was my tablet. And with that tablet, it wasn't even the one I could afford, but I was like, okay, let's get this. And what was interesting with it, it came with the stylus, and it was a way to actually now all of a sudden create notes. And I did, at first I didn't understand it, because it's like, okay, you can draw here, yeah, okay? And it, grew up to do a process where I actually took notes in class and then at night I could actually reflect on what I went through. And it actually now has reached a point where it has replaced my diary. Um, I used to carry a diary everywhere, but now I carry my cell phone like everyone. And the sad thing is that I actually kind of have a love-hate relationship with my technology. I think on my bedside, I rest with about five devices, which is like two laptops, um, a camera at times, and don't ask me why they're on my bedside. But it, it is that, and the fact that the high dopamine rush that we get from technology, I think for me, it actually influences the work that I create as well. Because I will be speaking to someone, and I can reflect instantly. And I would also say that I actually owe my career to social media and basically technology has um, heightened the speed of my career and basically even the goals I had set for when I'd be maybe 30, I was able to achieve in like a year. So it, I think that's where technology comes in. And how are you making your money? <laughs> Um, interestingly, uh, I think technology has actually heightened or actually made my bank balance bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think the way it scared me, and it was the first time where, and I'll actually even disclose the amount, um, when I just won the Jiraxa Culture Art Award last year at Barclays, I had a, a series of work, so it was 10 prints, and they had an edition of three. And the series was going for 30,000 Rand, and I thought that was a lot of money. But it sold out in 30 minutes, and there was literally 90,000 Rand in the bank, just like that. And I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and from that, and what I think most creatives are not taught is the idea of saving. So that money I actually saved it all away. So I did not go buy anything fancy. Um, and that becomes insurance to your ideas. So the fact that I could make a nine month salary in one day, it meant I had nine months to actually take time off, create exactly what I want to create without anyone telling me, like, please make this for me. I'm, like, I re reject commissions completely because they take away from the creative process. So I'll say this to Tom. Sarah, you were going to have a copy the Rogola trials are something like very emotional for South Africans. Um, I would love to hear from you, like what have you learned about what's worked and what hasn't in the process, and how do you apply it in, in operating with different forms of, of archive? I mean, I'm just looking at the Samuel team in, in front. Uh, they've got quite impressive archives themselves. You know, like, what does it mean also for an audience um, to be able to, to access um, archives? 
uh, it's a really big, hard question. What is it, what, it, the, basically, the significance of being able to access the archives. What is it learned? How, how do we do it well? Um, um, well, to be honest, like, um, the first time I came across this snippet from the Ragonia trial was in about 2012 or 2013 when I was at a trance party and Nelson Mandela's voice started playing, saying, I have fought against white domination, and I was like, oh, this is so dope, like, awesome. Um, and it turned out that actually that was a big dispute over the first attempt to try and restore the Dictabox um, through a partnership with the South Africans and the British, and there was a copyright dispute and it leaked out. Um, so since then, there's been quite a lot of caution around um, the, the process, just necessarily because you know uh, the French institutions have put so much resources and time into training our archivists, skills, uh, skills swapping, and so on and so forth, and literally you know using the machinery and stuff. That what you heard, if any of you had the chance to listen to it today, um, is a pretty good rendering of the. Uh, the sound, but with a disembodied female voice that every 20 seconds goes, <laughs> which is pretty torturous to have to listen to, but um, there were just sensitivities around how the accessibility of this was going to work, and it's our understanding that um, throughout, by, at some stage in the year, they will be available out of the archives and hopefully on the, the archives um, website platform without disembodied female over the trial. She doesn't exist, she's not really there. It is like Chinese water torture, having to listen to it. Um, so, I think that, well, the one thing is that it, it, it really is, this is like a start of a, a whole new project, a much broader one, because I understand now that off of this project and the skill transfer that's happened between the sound technicians in France and showing some of our archivists in the sound archives, that we're now going to be able to move on to the TRC Dictabox. And Dictabox was only used for a very particular period in, the, in time, so I'm not actually sure if it's Dictabox that they're digitizing just to, you know, not be lying to anyone. Um, but it really does, like, once we get to the point that the archives can comfortably put it up online, the idea is that you then can, as an artist, as a DJ, interact with those kind of um, sound works and incorporate them, I mean, uh, I have these wonderful utopian visions of radio stations, you know, on any time there's a public holiday and we get rah-rah about heritage. Like really getting into snippets, and not just from Nelson Mandela's speech, which is mind-blowing, but you know, I'm a Cathedra's uh, interview, interview, cross-examination, not the interview, as we um, Ring, Club, uh, and some of the listener names, like uh, the witnesses, like people who worked on the farm that just happened to be the underground headquarters of MK and the Communist Party and got, got caught up in all of this and you hear the, the intimacy and the pain of their experience because they get held in detention <coughs> for 90 days before appearing. They're not told, you know, a lot of the time they've had such stressful uh, processes of interrogation before they even get to the courtroom and that's really missing in the existing secondary literature because we haven't had access to these recordings for 50 years up until this point. So, um, and one of the other really cool, I don't know if I'm asking your question, I'm just telling you things that I think I should. What would you like to see in future archive work? Um, one of the things that happened is there's a French film production company. I already told you guys this is quite weird. But, um, and they, um, we're able to interview some of the remaining Rogonia trialists like Dennis Goldberg and Andrew Langeni and Amin Kisadra before he passed away. Mm -hmm. And they got the trialists to listen to the recordings um, and they go and speak at some schools in Victoria and stuff. And what was so amazing is that these guys have been interviewed about it so many times that they constantly hit the big themes and, and you know, people generally ask the same questions that when they got to listen to the audio, they started remembering completely different things. Different people in the courtrooms, different moments, stuff that I've never come across in the existing secondary literature. And only two of the trials are still alive today, but the idea of you know looking forward, if we really can grab onto the skills transfer across from France, and you know, it, it, there is a bit of a lag when we work with the National Archives, when we work with anything with government, there's a lag. But now that the door's kind of been opened, there's scope for us to push it much further into stuff from the 70s, from the 80s, where people are still more genuinely alive. 
And to have that engagement of people listening to themselves in, uh, in the court setting, it, it, it really does bring up new content that is to start, it's, it's, it's old content that's new. Um, so, yes, I should stop there.